who don't know, the Free State Project is a movement of voluntary human action where we are trying to concentrate libertarians in the state of New York. I think we've not done uh, more in the last decade than every other libertarian movement combined has accomplished in the last five decades. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, libertarians and anarchist movers, natives and those on your way, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Free State Live, where you get to hear about all the ways you can live free and thrive in the free state of New Hampshire. First and foremost, time to welcome everyone back to the show. As always, I'm Justin O'Donnell, uh, former libertarian candidate for U.S. Senate and author of Live Free and Thrive, 101 Reasons Liberty Lives in New Hampshire, and so should you. Joining me tonight, we have our keyboard warrior extraordinaire and everyone's favorite family man from Manchester, Kevin from the internet. How are you, Kevin? Hey, pretty good. Uh, Candidate for nothing. Um, We'll (laughs) never be a candidate for anything. We'll, we'll get I you just, eventually. We finally got Jason Thorns after 20 years. I mean, that's true. I shouldn't say never. You never yeah, know. Never say never. You, sooner, sooner or later, you're going to get involved in your school board. Probably won't oh, be pretty. That would be a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure our resident stand up comic, Tall Bill, will have some jokes to make about it. Won't you, Bill? No. <laughs> no. You don't want to pressure Kevin into running for office with us? <clears throat> no. No? <laughs> well, well, somebody has to run for office because if not, not enough people run for office, we don't get great memes uh, of people trolling the legislative process to its utmost extent. I mean, we, we've all dreamed of how many times we can say meow in a, a traffic stop with a Vermont state trooper. But the real question is, how many times can you say taxation is theft in a legislative debate? If I know that taxation is theft, it denigrates each and every one of us when someone calls us thieves by saying that taxation is theft. I would argue that taxation is theft. (laughs) None other than the mic drop himself we have with us tonight, one of our favorite state reps, Jason Gerhardt. And just to remind ah. everybody, before I pop in with Jason, that the Free State Project is actually a 501c3 charitable nonprofit. <laughs> we do not endorse candidates' legislation, and the views reflected by your hosts here tonight and our guests don't necessarily reflect the views of the Free State Project organization. We just find it fun. Jason, how are you? Thanks for joining us tonight. I appreciate that disclaimer. It's almost like the used car thing. Or the guy go. Yeah. I, mean, I grew up in sales. I can do it a hundred times if I need to. Uh, <laughs> You got a used car, Jason. No, oh, no. <laughs> Way past used. <clears throat> well, while I'm here trying to bully Kevin into running for school board uh, at some point in the future, I mean, what was it that possessed you to run for state rep finally and like get involved? I mean, you've been around for um, a while and like what, what made you finally make that jump? Well, I kind of been planning this for a while since I was actually in prison. Um, it's so I got involved in a federal income tax case and ended up doing 12 and a half years. And while there, I kind of thought things through, many things. And one of them was kind of, where do we go? How do we kind of fix what's going on? Because my case was in 2007, so I heard about the Free State Project beforehand, which is kind of funny. My mom, who's a teacher, on Long, well, she was on Long Island. Now she's up here in New Hampshire, where everybody should be. But um, she actually mentioned it to me. She's like, did you hear about the Free State Project? So I guess in teacher circles down on Long Island, we're trending pretty well. So anyway, I looked into it. One thing led to another. And the case that I was involved with was up in New Hampshire. So when I got out, I claimed homeless and they kicked me out into the streets. So I was in Manchester for a little bit. And now I'm about 25 minutes north of Concord. And I ran for office and won. So I'm just, um, it, I mean, I don't know how much of the platform you want to talk about, but as far as the federal income tax, it's all bogus. So that's what my, that was part of the debate. <clears throat> well, I'm sorry, not the debate. It was H.R. 16, House Resolution 16, was to require the IRS to answer three questions. So I don't know if you guys want me to go into that now or if we're just going to – Well, it wasn't. This this is the first time you brought this up. So um, the resolution you posed, which is one of the seven bills you sponsored in in the state house, uh, is something you tried to bring up at a local level too. And how did that go with it like in in the past cycle when you tried to bring it up locally? So I'll say this for people that don't know. New Hampshire has a really cool – local government thing going on so in smaller towns we have town meetings everybody gets into the school gymnasium now there's about four uh, was it 30 about 3800 registered 
voters in Northfield, I believe it is. That's the town I live in. My district is Franklin, the city of Franklin and Northfield. But anyway, 50, 60 people get in the auditorium and they're like, hey, you want to spend 20 grand on a cop car? Yay, nay, right? So interestingly enough, if you get 25 registered voters, you can put anything you want as a warrant article, as in having the selectmen do something like ask a question. So I figured, okay. So I had them ask the IRS three specific questions and they, well, one of the selectmen tried to table the motion off the rip because you have to go door to door and knock on doors in January and February in New Hampshire. It was, it was kind of rough. But point being is I got the signatures. I went there and then my state rep, who is still our state rep in Northfield, said basically, listen, this is interesting and all that, but this is an issue for Concord. So I said, okay, that was March of 2021. So I said, okay. So actually in that speech, part of it, I said, you know, my state rep said this is an issue for Concord. I'm like, I'm not saying who he is. I'm going like that over there. But um, yeah, it was just, everything has kind of been a little one step at a time. And I just want to tell people, because I don't know how many people listening are actually in New Hampshire right now, but if you do run for a local office and you lose horribly, like I did, so I ran for selectman, but more just, I had a reason to go knock on people's doors and talk about this, the, um, the Warren article to get the IRS to answer these questions. But because you don't want to get shot, you know, I'm running for office. Every, you know, everybody's cool with that. But point being is the, I, I got uh, 13 votes and I voted for myself. The winner got 156 or something. And there was four other people running. So I did horrible. I tied with the, I mean, I forget what it was. It was horrible. So point being is even if you really get your butt whooped pretty good, you got to keep on getting back in because it's all a notor not notoriety. I shouldn't say that, but you got to kind of get your message out there. And the few people that you knock on their door and they, they know, so you start talking about the IRS is crooked and all that. And they're there. You know what I mean? They're really, those are the people that are going to remember your name forever. Cause who goes and knocks on somebody's door in the middle of winter talking about the IRS is corrupt. I mean, well, in New Hampshire more than average, but I'm saying. I was going to say, I've done it. <laughs> <laughs> then the cops uh, come, you know, it gets messy, but yeah. Yeah. So I, I mean, what, what are these questions you wanted to ask? Like what was, what's the meat of this resolution that you started knocking on people's doors in town in the middle of January and led two years later to you being a state rep here in New Hampshire to ask these questions uh, in a way that's now going viral on the internet. Well, I hope it does. I really, I really hope that people start questioning what's going on because the money doesn't even go anywhere. It just goes to pay the national debt. So supposedly owed to these private banks, the federal reserve, all that crooked. So, you know, I'm, I'm done with all that. So um, the questions were, what is the definition? Why? Okay. Where in the income tax code is the uh, income defined? The word income defined, it isn't, nowhere. This former, um, it actually is in Aaron Russo's Freedom to Fascism. Sheldon Cohen, I believe his name was, former IRS commissioner. He admits it on tape. The second question was, is the average American who does not exercise a federal privilege liable for the federal income tax? Simply trades his time for money. Is he liable for the federal income tax? Because the federal privilege is something like selling guns to the army or something like that. They know you're going to screw them over. Everybody does. Toilet seats are what, 600 bucks each back in the 70s? Like it's, it's just part of the game. So the whole thing was, okay, we're going to cut our losses by at least getting some of that money back. <clears throat> so that's the second one. And the third one was, why have numerous IRS commissioners, congressmen, everybody else, they always say it's a voluntary tax. All right, let's talk about it because that's on record all over the place. That's not even debatable. So anyway, unfortunately, I had 60, well, 59 plus me. So 60 reps voted in favor of it. And then what was it, 280 or 220, whatever it was, a ton more didn't. And the Democrats, okay, so I don't know if you guys, how much time you spend at State House, but the, the whips, the people that like kind of tell the other members what to do, kind of supposedly. So they'll either have a red or green scarf or the Democrats go cheap. They have paper like folders that are red and green. So they can tell their people that are basically brain dead, like, oh, vote, press the green button. Everybody always says that, too. You know, so anyway, they actually wanted that resolution to die, which I don't understand why. Because if we don't send the money to the federal government and have it come back with all these strings, we can keep it in the community and then decide what to do with it. Why would you send it out to some crooked people that want to just, you know, what I mean? it just, yeah. So I'm working, actually, some Democrats did vote for it. So I'm, I'm it wasn't entirely a wash, but it's just, uh, it's just frustrating, you know? But So how did you come up with those three questions? Like, like where, what, what was, what were you doing? How did you come up with those specific, those are three very specific questions, you know? Well, I think three is a magical number. I'm one of three children um no besides that though three kind of sticks in your mind and that's also why i used three different planks not communist planks but planks to my campaign so one was a establishing a state-owned bank 
which North Dakota has had since 1919. They were tired of the bankers back east getting over on them. So they said, okay, we're done. So they take all tax revenue by law, deposit it into their own bank, and then they just loan it out to themselves interest-free. It's genius. So they've been doing that since, you know, for over 100 years now. Um, the second plank was reining in mega corporations because to this day, no agricultural corporation in Puerto Rico can exceed 500 acres. So I don't know. I don't want to get into the whole history, but corporations were kept on a super tight leash back in the day. And in the 1880s, Supreme Court magically said, oh, there are people, you know, under the 14th Amendment. That's a whole other thing we can deal with. But and then the third one was establishing the truth about the federal income tax. So, yes, the three questions are just very simple. I like to th I want everybody to be free to the to the level of responsibility that they can possess of themselves. But the point being is that I don't like these kind of things that people set up where like, oh, okay, well, all you got to do is you got to write this letter, you got to fill in this little block, and then you got to mail this to Puerto Rico, and then you got to take a gold coin and put it in this envelope. That's all nonsense to me. I just want it to be very simple. So these three questions, I think anybody over a 60 IQ can kind of comprehend. You know what I mean? What is the definition of income? Am I liable for this? And, you know, why do you say it's voluntary? It's no way for them to kind of get the lawyers involved and parachute in and say, oh, well, this is, you know, so I don't know if that makes sense, but that's where I'm at. <clears throat> so were these, but were these like three, it seems like there's like, it's almost like those are three chinks in the armor or something of the IRS. And, the, you know, did, did you stumble upon these? One of them you, you cited, um, somebody you said had written about it. I don't remember who you said. Oh, it's in Aaron Russo's documentary, Freedom to Fascism, right. the, the definition okay. of word income. But, um, Okay, well, there's a guy, Pete Hendrickson, who I'm actually going to have come up eventually to New Hampshire. He's in Michigan, but he gives these little seminars. But what's cool about him is everything is just up front. All his research is on his website, um, Deep Horizons. No, sorry, Deep Horizons. LostHorizons.com. It's all free, but you can get his book if you want. You know, it's like 20 bucks, whatever. But it just lays it all out. And it's not one of those things where, okay, you got to not, you have to give up your federal citizenship and a lot of that kind of stuff. That's interesting. Okay, fine. I, I get it. And it probably makes a lot of sense. But for the average person working nine to five or whatever, mechanic or I'm a carpenter, you know, I don't have time to play all those games. Like, I just want something very straightforward. His method is very straightforward. You just simply say, okay, you, because uh, I don't want to get too deep into it. But basically, you have to, re, you have to, whenever they file a W 2 or something against you, you have to basically say, no, 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 that's incorrect and send a corrected one in with zero income because you didn't make any federal income unless you exercise a federal privilege. But I don't want to get too lost in the weeds on all that. So, but they make you jump through hoops to, uh, to claim that you didn't earn it. So you, it's almost like a guilty until proven innocent thing again, but with your income. Well, you know it's, saying there? well, we all see, this is a problem. So they use terms, they call them terms of art. The words are defined, not in common use. So wages, for instance, doesn't mean what you think it means. Employee doesn't mean what I think it is. That has to do with an employee of a political subdivision or what, you know, it has nothing to do with me working for you, putting a roof on your house. I'm not an employee and you know what I mean? And you're the, the guy I work for is not my employer. It's very creepy. <sighs> and I have to admit, you know what? Like the other day, actually seeing Sununu up close, 10 feet away, whatever, we were, we were I was asking him some questions, but the point is, you have to have some respect for these people in this the setup that they've created. You know what I mean? Like these professional level bureaucrats and politicians are very impressive in this this whole house of cards they created. And I just I have a lot of respect for it. I got to say, I mean, from a scam point of view, these guys are good. I've been, I was in federal prison for twelve and a half years. I met some good scam artists, but these guys are next <laughs> level. You know what I mean? They're just they're next level. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting question. You you said what put you in prison, what got you was getting hung up in a tax case. I mean, and what was the background there? How'd you get hung up in a tax case in the first place here in the land you in, in prison in New Hampshire? Um, and, and like, what's that kind of a backstory? And like, how has that impacted your political thought and the way you've come about things the past few years? Well, first off, I think it makes you value time a little more. And you don't really just kind of mm. every day, you kind of, I mean, I don't say every, well, I realize that there's some people living a, a hellish existence right now. And not all of them deserve it. I, I don't think anybody serving a, not, a victimless crime deserves to be in there. I mean, I was sitting across eating lunch every day with because you generally sit in the same spots. It depends what place you're in. It's a lot of, but in general, you kind of sit with the same people and everything. So, um, this guy was he had you know he was third felony for marijuana growing weed out in Michigan. You know, then decades like that kind of stuff is just. I think we need to kind of just put our foot down and say, okay, it's done. The drug war is over. That's why Matt Sansasso's bill ending the drug war was just genius because. A, it got a lot of people on the record. I think we got 70 votes for it, which 
I mean, all the Democrats should have been on board with that. I don't know where they're standing on that. But um, I, I digress. <clears throat> yeah, I, I just – that was very odd. I thought it was going to be close. And I'm looking – I'm like, what are you – yeah. So um, I forget where you were going with this. What gave me the impetus to do all this? Or like, what's that know... part of the case you got wrapped up in? And like, oh, I'm sorry. You... I got totally sidetracked. Yeah. So <laughs> the there was a husband and wife, 65 years old. They didn't pay their federal income taxes. And they ended up suing the federal government in state court. And then the case got kicked up to the feds. So that's why they came after him as hard as they did. So anyway – it was a standoff for 10 months. He was holed up in the house. His wife en and eventually came back. I was writing for my college newspaper at the time. It's kind of a longer story, but I was going to enlist in the military. I was kind of still under the whole jingoistic kick. My twin brother had served in Iraq. He was a, he's a black, well, he was a Black Hawk crew chief. So I was like, you know what? I'm stateside. I'm able-bodied. What am I doing? Because they had just extended the National Guard guys tours from 15 to 18 months. It was a three-month increase. I think it was 15, 18 in the summer or summer fall of uh, 06 because Iraq started heating up. So, um, yeah, I just – one thing led to another. So, yeah, I started going to school just to get it going as a higher rank. And then that case, Ed Brown, the, the Browns case came to light. So I went up there and interview him, and then one thing led to another, and my my ship my ship out date ended up getting delayed. It was supposed to be June, like early June. It got kicked back to late August. So if that if I had shipped out on time, I never would have been involved in this. I would have been out in Iraq or <laughs> Afghanistan poking landmines. Cause I went in as a combat engineer, which is like specialized infantry, because I had worked on a lot of bridges in New York City prior. I was doing bridge painting kind of stuff, supervising. So I was like, I know how to climb a bridge because their whole kick is just destroying bridges. So I was like, oh yeah, whatever. But um. Yeah. So one thing led to another and then I got caught up in that because I feel like if you stumble upon somebody like that and they're fighting for right, what are you going to do? You're just going to say, you know, walk away and be like, hey, good luck. I mean, I did eventually leave at a point, but it was kind of a point where I had to a ship out. And then B, it was also there was it had kind of reached the stalemate point. I don't know if you guys how close you followed that whole standoff, but they, they got to a certain point where it's kind of just like, all right, we're just going to wait them out. Yeah. And uh but and then they didn't. So, <laughs> and what did they charge you with involved in that? I, I mean, up there, just like reporting, helping, but you weren't the one dodging taxes or uh, doing anything crazy or in, in a standoff yourself with the feds. I mean, so like, what did you end up getting charged with that landed you in prison? Um, ah, crack the old neck. So, <laughs> charge. It gets a little weird, but just try to follow me here. Charge one was conspiracy to impede – no, conspiracy to commit offenses against the United States. Charge two was conspiracy to impede officers of the United States from discharging their duties. And then the, the subcharge – I forget what they called it – was conspiracy to assault a federal officer. The third charge was aiding and abetting. Then the fourth charge was conspiracy to oh – no, not – yeah. It was no, possession of a firearm during a crime of violence. But that was – they call it a predicate. That conspiracy now is based off of count one and two. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, that, that's important. That's important to remember because that's what I ended up getting out on. Because we'll get to that. Count five was possession of an explosive device during a crime of violence, but I beat that at trial, which was great because that was a thirty-year minimum charge, consecutive charge. So, count four though, the possession of a firearm, because it was predicated off those two conspiracies. A Supreme Court decision later on said you can't have a violent crime based off a conspiracy. A conspiracy is just an agreement. Hey, you want to rob a bank? All right, boom. Now the conspiracy ends and the actual charge begins. I think at least that's what I thought. I don't know. A lot of that legal stuff is so kind of like just phony anyway. So it's meant to be confusing. Mm -hmm. uh, it sounds like they just charged you with conspiracy, uh, not actually doing anything. Uh, just basically thinking and talking about helping somebody who wanted to stand up for themselves against the state. Well, I would – I mean, I'm not going to lie. There was maybe some firearms purchased and stuff like that. I mean, you know, it's New Hampshire. It don't be a deal. But I, I would I, – I wouldn't – I they never could put any violent actions on me or even threatening. I never did any of that because, I mean, look, I'm not on it. But the second thing is the – actually, they had a video of me going to the cops that were out front and giving them hamburgers and stuff. And we had that, I think it was the second pic, uh, barbecue or whatever. We had a concert over there when they had the helicopter swooping everybody. That was crazy. This thing is strafing people, like coming down 50 feet less off the ground. It's pretty wild. Jeez. So, yeah. But anyway, at least it was it didn't end like the Bundy situation, which is right. horrible. But well, I mean, right. and, and now you're here as the state rep in New Hampshire. Uh, like, at taking that same fight uh, to the legislative hall and actually trying to change the laws they use against people. 
Um, and it's not the only law. You've sub- you submitted seven bills this year um, or joined in sponsoring or submitted yourself seven bills. Um, and a lot of them are on these lines. And I think one of my favorites was uh, exempting firearms manufactured in New Hampshire from federal law altogether. It was an um, interesting. Like, what, put, what possessed you to come up with that one? And uh, I mean, I love it. I don't care what the justification is. I think we should pass it. Uh, but what's your justification on that one? And how do you argue and sell that to uh, somebody who might not agree with us already? Well, the concept is if you, if the people, okay. So do local people have the knowledge or the, the ability to say what's dangerous or not dangerous, right? So we know in New Hampshire, we already know we're here. Nobody gives it. I mean, guns are like whatever. Nobody cares, right? So I think we should have the ability to say, oh, okay, this gun has a barrel that's less than 16 inches. I don't care. That has nothing to do with anything. Who gives a shit? Mean, so I, I believe the ability for people to decide what's dangerous should be made by the people who are going to be affected by it, not by some tool bags in D.C. that just want to make a $200 uh, tax stamp on each one of these. Interestingly enough, somebody that's very supportive of that bill told me the situ- the reason they got involved was because they have a Cub Scouts team, or I forget what you call it, right? A pack or whatever it is. Um, yeah. Okay, try. What do you say? A pack, a pack. or what is it? Oh yeah, okay. Cub Scout pack, Boy Scout okay. troop. Oh okay, okay, troop. So, um, and one of them firearm manufacturers here in New Hampshire is going to give them free silencers and he he was saying how kids always put in earplugs wrong so he doesn't want them damaging their ears so he said okay this is awesome but he's not paying two hundred dollars per each silencer it's insane so I, th- I think they're gonna give him like 16 or 10 or whatever it is but that's kind of funny and i like that that's the, that's where the support is coming for from is somebody that it's a legitimate grievance that has no justification besides some greedy people down in dc there's no justification for that you know kids don't want to hurt their ears no, well, no, no, no. We got it. What? So yeah. that's actually the argument we got uh, passed when the ban on suppressors and NFA items such as suppressors was lifted in the first place in New Hampshire. Uh, the name of the bill was the Hearing Protection Act uh, to <laughs> legalize suppressing a lot of people. Passed, and that passed under Maggie Hassan when she was the governor. Um, mm. So uh, under Democrat control and, and just pushing something like that. And I always try and bring it up um, as an example: the United Kingdom. Uh, and the United Kingdom and Great Britain, some of the strictest gun control laws on the planet. And like you, you have to jump through every hoop imaginable just to get a like small bore 22 hunting rifle. Uh, if you live out in the boonies to go hunt on your own property. Um, but once you do get approved in most cases, in most regions, you are required by law to have a suppressor for that weapon. <laughs> oh, in the United yeah, Kingdom. That's... That's genius, though. I mean, why would you want to make more noise when you have to? That's like these idiots driving around with the mufflers that sound stupid. <laughs> like, I know. I, uh, yeah. But so that's that that bill. Oh, uh, OK, the reason that even came to mind was because Montana did that back in 2008. Their governor signed it into law way back then. Tennessee has already done it, I believe. Oh, really? There's a bunch of yeah, there's a bunch of states that have done it. But we ex- well, that. not we. I, I actually asked some people who are into guns because. Nowadays, I can't be into guns until we have another another bill that I put in. We'll talk about that. Maybe change that. But the point being is um, also those triggers that help you fire faster, all that kind of the bump stock stuff, all that new stuff that you're trying to ban, too. It's all in there. I, except for I don't believe fully automatic because that would be a little bit of a, a hurdle too high right now to to uh, to breach. But the point being is just to you don't want to make anybody a felon or some kind of criminal because they bought something back in the day and now they all of a sudden decided to make it illegal. That's we have to draw the line there. We shouldn't, you know what I mean? There's no That's, reason anybody in here in New Hampshire or the country should be suffering for some bureaucratic fuckery, you know? That, I mean, uh, oops, first, screw. Yeah. No, that that's the first thing that came to my mind when I saw that that bill too was the same thing of like, oh, perfect. I'd rather buy guns in the state I'm going to live and stay in and avoid any changes that are made federally that instantly turn me into a felon while I'm sleeping yes. or I'm not paying attention. So I didn't realize that that change came or whatever ghost gun ban or raid you got going on. Like, perfect. There's, this is a way I can, as a resident in New Hampshire, I can, I can dodge all that stuff and just not even make it an issue. Not even a novel concept either. Like Jason pointed out, other states like Montana have already passed these kind of a thing, even if they're maybe not enforced because of the federal laws still on the books. Uh, But Texas currently has a federal lawsuit against the U S government that's uh, going 
um, in, in being heard in federal court, we'll see how long it takes to get to the Supreme Court or if they'll even hear it, uh, that says that any gun manufactured in Texas, sold and used only in Texas, can't be regulated by the federal government uh, because it's not engaged in interstate commerce. Um, and, and I think here in New Hampshire, we have a whole other law in place that would make it even better uh, because we've already nullified the state's ability to assist the federal government in enforcing their laws. So if you passed a law saying that now the state isn't going to have these rules in place, then the federal laws are the only thing left and the state police and local police in New Hampshire are prohibited from enforcing the federal ones. <clears throat> That's a, a whole new ch way to change that game there. Um, but, yeah, no, your other bills are all great. I, I've got the list up here, and um, one of them, and I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie, I haven't taken the time to read the text of all of them, but you're establishing the State Bank of New Hampshire. I do want to hear more about that and your selling point on that because I'm also a huge fan of secession, and I, I love the push for secession that we have in New Hampshire. And I was joking with Kevin and Bill before the show that I think if we were to secede, then establishing a state bank is kind of a non bow there because we've seen how central banking goes. Understood. See, that's the thing. It's not owned. So yeah. the central – it's owned by the state, which changes yeah. the whole dynamic of having any kind of weird hidden assets and these kind of um, – I can't even think of the, the acronym now for all that phony stuff insurance they buy i forget what they're called oh like the uh -oh. ncua and the, the fdic and stuff well the fdic that's a that's a whole nother scam yeah they're trying to say they, what do they have one percent of all deposits on hand who are they gonna bail you know there's no it's, 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 crazy. it's just a it's crazy yeah it's just Threshold window dressing it's, thing. it's crazy it's, yeah it's scam but my point is what i was saying about the central uh the, the publicly owned bank is that you know what's in the bank and what they're investing in and they invest within the state so north dakota now, I'm just going off memory here, but they have 12 banks per 100,000 people per capita, and the average for the rest of the United States is two. So mm. this public bank actually supports local community banks because now they have a credit line to the big boys, exactly what they have access to. And the Bank of North Dakota only has one branch. It's not like they're going to build them everywhere. It has nothing to do with that. It just has to do with the central clearinghouse kind of concept. And also, if I have – so um, in New Hampshire, they have something called – the uh, <laughs> public deposit in PDIP, it stands for pool, public deposit in uh, investment pool. And what it is, is any. So I just went to the Merrimack County delegation meeting today. And OK, this is kind of interesting. I don't know if you guys are familiar, probably are, but all state reps are part of the county delegation. So you are the county government as a state rep, which is kind of interesting and kind of annoying because you don't really get paid for it. But the, the whole point is the they have 15 million sitting in this PDIP account which is just a checking account, but it pays a little bit higher than if they just went to whatever corporate mega bank. So it's still operated by a mega bank. But the point being is that money, it's just tax money. that's just sitting there. Why wouldn't we use that and then multiply it by nine, 10 times? Because I don't even think there's any reserve requirements realistically on these banks nowadays. So you can multiply the money inf infinitely and we can use it to build bridges, schools or whatever, you know, I know you guys aren't big on public schools, but you can use it to build <clears throat> these, these, public infrastructure projects, because when you build anything, half of the cost of that project is interest payments to the mega corporations, the banks. So, you know, if you build a $50 million bridge, 25 million is just interest payments, which is insane because they stretch it out over so many years. So people don't realize how much they're getting screwed for. And the, I just don't understand why we wouldn't take that 25 million in that example and put it back into the state coffers. I don't get it. I mean, well, I now mean, you could argue, oh, well, yeah. Why does a bridge cost 25 million to begin with? Um, I remember reading a story about a time a bridge got washed out in Hawaii and the state government told the residents of the village that they couldn't afford to rebuild it. It wasn't in the budget. They had to wait mm -hmm. two years till the next cycle and then they might be able to get around to it and they'd have their bridge back in like four years. And the residents of the tourist community that relied heavily on tourist traffic to like keep their school open and their library open and like pay their own bills said, screw it, got together and built the bridge for like 50 grand in a matter of two months. I've heard a similar situation out in Iraq. I forget what book I was reading about that, but yeah, because you know how the, all the military contracts are all fraudulent anyway. So it's, I mean, I can't say anything on that per se. That just requires people to be more active and involved. Oh, so somebody just said <clears> if New <throat> Hampshire starts its own bank, tie it to gold and silver. So interestingly enough, 
there's a senator nicely out in Tennessee, and he's introducing a public bank bill, but they're tying it to a gold depository, just like Texas has, wow. which I think That's is cool. genius, especially from a secession point of view, if anybody's into that, that now you have your own <laughs> legit money sitting there because everybody knows when you go to war, when you go into war, gold talks. Nobody wants your paper. So the ability for the state to have that. Now you could say, oh, it's a risk because somebody could come in and grab it. Well, that's when you're supposed to have everybody that's, you know, military age kind of say, no, you're not taking our, sh our stuff. That's ours. And I think that's also the benefit of having a depository is everybody essentially owns a share of it because they have some in there. You know, I think the average person wouldn't want to have a million dollars under their mattress. So. All right. Yeah. Well, I, I, I have one like question I want to leave on with you, Jason. Yeah. Uh, we're far enough into your first term here as a state rep, and like you've gotten the lay of the land and seen how things kind of progress from the inside uh, and seen how your bills have been treated. What are you looking forward to next year? And like what's on your docket to submit for bills next year? And what kind of changes do you want to like push going forward and that you would encourage people to support moving forward now that you have a better lay of the land and how things work there? It's it's a little bit difficult to say. Every day I think of great things, but time is a, is a serious constraint right. because now you're putting in a bill, let's say the public bank bill that went to commerce and it's very, okay, you have to now go to the next committee meeting and you're supposed to be there to help out and push things through and it, it's just very time intensive. So even though one bill might seem simple, Sometimes it doesn't really turn out to be all that simple. So point being is, I don't know. I don't know what the focus ought to be at this time because do we start – I don't want to get into the policy of trying to put Band-Aids on things. I think we kind of need to just create right. the alternative and move on down the road. But I don't know where that line is drawn, and I'm not that smart. I mean, I'm a carpenter. So what I would hope is that we can kind of create some kind of brain trust in a sense, free of the whole FDR concept. But And there's a lot of cool – Democrats out there, these progressive, for instance, one of the Democrats put forward a bill to ban any corporation from owning single family homes. Now, I know that's going to kind of strike you guys as communistic or whatever, but I think that's genius. Corporations are not people. You can put any kind of restriction on a corporation that you want. <clears throat> back back in the day, the Indiana state constitution outlawed any private banking corporations. It was, it's very, if you look at the history of corporations, they were kept on a short leash. So I just think that reaching out to people like that and saying, okay, you don't want these corporations owning single family homes. What else don't you want these corporations doing? And now we can start getting them out of the way. So now we can have a community discussion among real people and not these, these corporate lawyers that parachute in to kind of mess things up. And, it, you know, there's just, a, there's a lot of ground to go with and I'm, I'm open to all ideas. So if anybody wants to shoot ideas my way, I'm definitely open to it. Awesome. Well, hey, well, thanks, thanks for so much for coming on. This has been enlightening, fun, and an interesting conversation. And I'm looking forward to what you do next year. Uh, I mean, you've submitted some of the more in, uh, interesting bills this year that we've seen on the docket, even if they haven't gotten the traction that they might have deserved or needed. Uh, you've been able to force the conversation in an interesting manner, at least, and uh, one that uh, is waking people up and you're forcing the opposition to go on the record that they don't believe taxation is theft and uh, that they do believe that they, they have the government have the right to steal. From that was the best. Everyone else. So. I like how the guy, he really got, he really got pissed off at the end. I had left at that point. Cause I already, you know, I was just, cause at the end, I don't know if you guys watch the whole video, but people start making announcements and I mean, sometimes they're worth listening to, but sometimes it's just kind of like, so I was like, okay, gotta go. And um, yeah, I wish I, I wish I'd actually stayed for that. Cause then they booed him down and they've kept them, they banned him from talking. So that's kind of funny. So yeah. I, so last thing I want to leave off with everybody is do get involved and do keep on top of your state reps. The, the roll calls, the NHLA, Matt Santasasso has been putting in for roll calls on everything now. And there, a lot of the establishment people aren't happy about it, but whatever. So point being is keep on track. And if they vote the wrong way on something, let them know. And when you email them, they'll know if you're, you know, say I'm your constituent, I live at this address, whatever. I, I think people discount how much that matters. You know, these people are very susceptible to public opinion. So that's all mm -hmm. I'm going to leave off with. And thank you guys for everything you're doing. I appreciate it. Jason, yeah. the man, dude, thank you. And thank, thank everyone you everyone for tuning in. Thanks for watching and your comments and questions. And we do appreciate it. Make sure you leave some comments below and let us know what else you want us to talk about in the future. And if you want to learn more about the Free State Project, now you can get involved. Check out FSP.org today. And we do have coming up this weekend one of our big two flagship events of the year. We have mm -hmm. the great New Hampshire Liberty Forum 
I think we just lost Jason, but he will be there <laughs> speaker this weekend. Uh, so make sure you head on over to nhlibertyforum.com right now to get your tickets if you haven't yet. And you can use our same code from last week, YIMBY, Y-M-B-Y, to get a discount on that ticket. Uh, so make sure nhlibertyforum.com, get your tickets today. And if you want to plan your visit any other time of the year, check out fsp.org slash visit. Hampshire, where you can get in touch with our great staff over uh, to help you plan that visit with your neighbors. And if you're already here and you need to get plugged into the community, check out the calendar because it's the most jam packed Liberty calendar of events worldwide. There's too much to do, but you can try. Uh, and of course, I'll let Kevin give his plug on the Discord. <laughs> That's it. That's all I have. It's Join the, the Discord. <laughs> Kevin's plug. All right. And Bill, you have anything? Come to Liberty Forum. Come to Porkfest. Awesome. I'll see you there. Oh, Until yeah. next time, everybody, thanks for tuning in and stay free. Yeah, I don't believe in destiny. I just do what's best for me. Don't listen to my enemies. They're just full of jealousy, yeah, this legacy You gon' see what's left of me You gon' see success in me You ain't seen the rest of I just me. wanna be the best at what I know Better than the rest, just watch me grow Put me to the test and watch me go This is my quest, I'ma make it known They call me obsessive, oh I know Call me selective